Every year in my residency program, we run an NFL fantasy league. Usually the names are pretty good. Nerdy, as you might expect. Things like the Lumbar Punters and Football Inc. Syndrome. One of my friends also picked the team name Amorosis Fullbacks. So in her honor today, we're going to make this week's episode about vascular causes of transient monocular vision loss. This episode was powered by Paul Hodge, a financial planner who works specifically with medical professionals. He has helped members of the Brainwaves podcast grow their wealth and manage risk. Learn more about how to secure your financial future at paul-hodge.com. Welcome back to Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler, and let's just jump right into it. Really important here before you even consider to build your differential is that you must confirm it is a monocular loss of vision, not a loss of vision in one hemifield, a homonymous hemianopsia, or in one quadrant of both eyes, a quadrantinopsia, but in one eye, just one. Because now you've localized the lesion somewhere anterior to the optic chiasm, and the causes of visual disturbance have been dramatically narrowed. Let's start by reviewing the anatomy. We usually do this in most episodes, so you can count on a quick tutorial of the retina, the optic nerve, and the orbit here. The retina receives vascular supply from the central retinal artery, a branch off the ophthalmic artery which originates off the internal carotid. The central retinal artery courses deep through the optic nerve to supply the superficial two-thirds of the retinal neural layers, whereas the posterior ciliary arteries, also branches off the ophthalmic, travel outside the optic nerve and supply the outer one-third of the retina and the optic nerve head just below the surface of the globe. Finally, the optic nerve head receives an anastomotic blood supply from the central retinal artery and the posterior ciliary arteries. After oxygen and nutrients are extracted here, blood eventually circulates out of the globe, exiting via the central retinal vein. This anatomy being considered, various degrees of transient ischemic attack or infarction of the retina, the eye, and the orbit can occur depending on the location of the clot. Starting proximally, an acute common carotid occlusion can result in the very rare but severe orbital infarction syndrome, which affects the globe and the muscles of the orbit. Because of the rich anastomotic collaterals from other arteries supplying the orbit, this is a rare syndrome. When an orbital infarction occurs, the patient is left with profound external ophthalmoplegia, complete and almost always permanent vision loss from retinal infarction, and ocular ischemia causing chemosis and scleral injection. Next, occlusion of the ophthalmic artery causes profound vision loss, often to the degree of no light perception, because it blocks both the retinal and choroidal circulation. In these cases, the retina becomes white and edematous, and no cherry red spot is seen because the choroid is not perfused. Retinal ischemia from an embolus transiently limiting perfusion to the retina, but then moving quickly along with subsequent reperfusion, is known as amaurosis fugax. In the typical patient with transient monocular vision loss of less than 5 minutes in duration, a vascular etiology is likely, and testing the carotids for atherosclerotic plaque buildup at the bifurcation and considering echocardiography to identify an embolic source is critical and should be done emergently. Certainly, giant cell arteritis is a possible cause of amaurosis fugax as well and must be considered carefully. Now, you might be wondering, if TIAs of the eye may occur secondary to a similar mechanism as that of hemispheric TIAs with contralateral weakness, why is amaurosis not included in the ABCD squared score? The reason is that, compared to transient hemispheric defects like impaired strength or language function, Transient monocular loss of vision is associated with significantly reduced risk of ipsilesional stroke when compared to hemispheric TIAs in the setting of carotid disease. Studies report a 2% annual risk of stroke following amaurosis, as compared to 5-8% to annual risk of stroke with hemispheric TIAs. This might be because of the multitude of non-vascular causes of transient monocular vision loss that can account for a patient's symptoms, whereas it would be pretty unusual for a transient hemibody weakness pattern to be caused by anything other than a cerebrovascular injury. Now moving back to the types of retinal ischemia. Prolonged retinal ischemia may manifest as a branch retinal artery occlusion or central retinal artery occlusion. Retinal ischemia on its own is a painless experience. In central retinal artery occlusion, the entire retina is devoid of oxygen and the patient's vision is reduced to finger counting or light perception vision only, and a cherry red spot may be seen on the fundus examination. CRAOs may be embolic, for instance, from a plaque that is dislodged from a stenotic carotid bifurcation or it could be vasculitic from giant cell arteritis. In an embolic CRAO, 
An embolus may be seen in the central retinal artery on ophthalmic examination. Various techniques, such as ocular digital massage or rapid intraocular pressure lowering, have been attempted with variable success. Intravenous tissue plasminogen activator may be safe and effective in circumstances of persistent CRAO, but intraarterial fibrinolysis carries greater risks than benefits, according to the EAGLE study. Giant cell arteritis would present usually with other typical symptoms, such as headache and jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, and symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica, and it usually affects older patients. Laboratory studies such as ESR and CRP would be helpful in making this diagnosis, and steroids should be instituted rapidly to avoid contralateral vision loss or stroke. The optic nerve itself is susceptible to vascular compromise. Occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries, which provide blood flow to the anterior optic nerve, the optic disc, is not currently thought to be an embolic process in the same manner as a CRAO or BRAO. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, or AION, is far more common than the posterior version, PION. AION occurs when perfusion to the optic nerve head is compromised and optic disc swelling is observed. The possibility of giant cell arteritis must be considered in an older adult, and it typically causes significant vision loss, and it may be associated with many of the previously described symptoms. Alternatively, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, NAION, may occur in younger adults who have other vascular risk factors and a crowded disc appearance. PION is a much rarer condition and is caused by reduced perfusion to the posterior optic nerve. It causes acute vision loss without optic disc swelling in two major circumstances. The first is giant cell, which must always be considered. The second is in a post-operative setting when the blood flow to an optic nerve is compromised or reduced, often in prone position surgery or in significant systemic hypotension. This is an important fork in the road when evaluating a patient with suspected ischemic optic neuropathy, distinguishing arteritic from non-arteritic AION. Evaluation of the fundus and laboratory testing is critical here, but your pretest probability can be dramatically influenced by the patient's age. It's practically unheard of to diagnose someone with arteritic AION under the age of 60, so anyone over 60 just get the ESR and CRP. It will be high in giant cell arteritis, and if it's over 100, you better believe you're starting steroids yesterday and organizing a temporal artery biopsy within a week. Arteritic AION typically shows disc edema that's described as a diffuse chalky white with or without disc hemorrhages in more severe cases. Another interesting consideration in the clinical history is the duration and character of symptoms. While we're mostly talking about transient vision loss, positive phenomena may be suggestive of hypoperfusive injury rather than embolic events. And certainly, the description of fortification scotomata, meaning a zigzag appearance of the visual scene, is highly specific for a visual migraine. The presence or absence of pain is often helpful in formulating a differential diagnosis as well. Pain associated with eye movement is typical of demyelinating optic neuritis and worsening of other neurologic symptoms in the setting of heat can be attributed to Uthoff's phenomenon from a prior demyelinating event. Ocular pain, nausea, vomiting, and the patient's description of a blurred vision and halos may be an indicator of angle closure glaucoma, and would generally be associated with ocular injection, a dilated pupil, and corneal edema. Periorbital pain and headache with photophobia or phonophobia may suggest migraine. Scalp tenderness and a pulseless temporal artery might suggest temporal arteritis. And finally, neck pain or neck injury can suggest a carotid artery dissection with resultant ocular and cerebral ischemia. Knowing the duration of the vision loss is also helpful. Ultra-brief episodes of vision loss which are provoked by eye movements can be due to compressive lesions of the optic nerve or the orbit. As the eye moves, the orbital or optic nerve mass chokes perfusion to the central retinal artery causing a gaze-evoked amaurosis. A change in position of the head from laying supine to standing upright can elicit seconds of darkened vision and are seen in cases of papilledema, where optic disc swelling is caused by elevated intracranial pressure. These episodes are called transient visual obscurations. In contrast, longer episodes of a transient visual defect, usually lasting 20 to 40 minutes, associated with fortification spectra would be more typical of a migrant's phenomenon. Classifying the pattern of field loss is also of high predictive value. An acute, horizontally respecting monocular visual field defect or altitudinal defect, like a shade coming up or down over half the vision in one eye, may be caused by retinal ischemia from amaurosis fugax if it's transient, 
or branch retinal artery occlusion if it's permanent. Alternatively, it could also indicate a retinal detachment, usually progressive and associated with new floaters or flashing lights. Non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy may also cause a monocular altitudinal scotoma. In contrast, peripherally constricted field defects are seen in patients with chronic papilledema or glaucoma, and would very rarely be associated with retinal ischemia. Finally, the monocular blurred vision with the appearance of seeing halos around lights is suggestive of angle closure glaucoma. Nearly any other pattern of visual field loss will either be progressive or permanent, and will have little localizing value in the patient with amaurosis. Retinal vein disorders, such as compressive orbitopathies, central retinal vein occlusion, carotid cavernous fistulas, and venous sinus stenosis generally do not cause a transient loss of vision. Some of these disorders are pretty nuanced, but you should know at least about a central retinal vein occlusion. In a CRVO, the patient will present with acute and permanent reduction of vision, and on fundus exam, the retinal veins will be dilated and tortuous, sometimes with an elevated optic disc, and you will see retinal flame hemorrhages 80% of the time. Fortunately, ophthalmologists have new intravitreal medications which can be used to reduce retinal swelling from a CRVO. The workup for amaurosis is entirely dependent on the characterization of symptoms and the clinical history. In addition to checking for inflammatory markers in older patients with suspected giant cell arteritis, some patients will benefit from carotid ultrasound or a CT or MR angiogram to evaluate for carotid disease and an echocardiogram for embolic sources. As we mentioned earlier, if amaurosis is due to atherosclerotic disease, usually this occurs at the carotid bifurcation, but rarely can involve the intracranial ICA just before the takeoff of the ophthalmic artery. A hypercoagulable workup should be pursued in a young person with transient monocular vision loss in the absence of any head or neck trauma or any prior history of migraines. Usually I start by checking things like factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene 2020A mutation, and antiphospholipid antibodies. But this may be followed up with an antithrombin 3 level, protein C and S levels, and homocysteine if the initial battery is negative. Lastly, you should consider an ophthalmology consultation. It's what they're there for and they can give you some great insights into the disorders affecting the anterior chamber in addition to what you may already suspect of the retina and optic nerve. A lot of the time you may not find anything on the workup and some tests may leave you with more questions than answers. In those cases, it's not the worst thing to find out your otherwise healthy patient doesn't have an ulcerated carotid artery plaque or a chronic autoimmune disease that will require months of high dose corticosteroids. That's all for Brainwaves this week. I'm Jim Siegler, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on the web at brainwaves.me or find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. Feel free to contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Jazar. I'm Erica Mejia. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves.